Today we are going to have Dr. Renee Morin talk about Honeycrisp, Bitter Pit, and Soft Scald Management, and then Mr. Glenn Kaler will talk about Ag Radar, the updates, and weather information that he has folded into that system. Today we have a special guest. Dr. Jennifer Foreman Orth is joining us from the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture Resources, and she's going to talk to you us briefly about spotted lanternfly. So, with that. Thank you so much for agreeing to give me a very brief time slot before the main content of your presentation. Um, I'm in charge of the forest pest outreach program at the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk to folks, not just from Massachusetts, but from anywhere in the Northeast about spotted lanternfly. Um, I see a bunch of folks from New York um, signing in on the chat and New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, all have known infestations of spotted lanternfly. And we have had several sightings of this pest in Massachusetts, but we haven't yet found an established infestation. So I just wanted to take a moment to basically show you a bunch of pictures of lanternfly so you can get that search image in your head and talk to you about why it's important to report it. Spotted lanternfly um, is a sap feeding insect like, like aphids or stink bugs that excretes a, a sticky substance known as honeydew when it feeds. And while they don't feed directly on fruit, they do gather by the thousands in orchards in states where they've been found, including Pennsylvania. Uh, so this is something you don't want to have to deal with in your orchard, even though it might not be directly impacting your fruit harvest. The honeydew that these bugs excrete cover trees, fruits, farm equipment, things like that. And once that honeydew is on a surface, it attracts something called a, a sooty mold, a type of fungus that is very unsightly and could cause issues with your fruit marketability and the way that you manage your harvest. Uh, it also attracts insects like yellow jackets that feed on the sap, which means if you have a pick your own orchard, you don't want an insect like this swarming in the fields either. Um, so we are actively trying to stop the spread of spotted lanternfly into Massachusetts. The adults are active in the late summer through hard frost. You can look for the egg masses. Right now, you can report anything you see at that web link below. And I think I'll put it in the chat when I'm done talking, just so people can have it, the massnrc.org slash pests. Um, if you are from another state and you can't find where to report it in your state, we can funnel reports over to where they need to go. So I don't wanna exclude anybody that's not from Massachusetts on this call, but that is basically, all I wanted to say, if you're on video, please take a look at the way that this insect looks and don't ever forget it and let us know if you see it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, coming and sharing that information with us. Uh, we are definitely wanna keep on top of that. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Glenn Kaler, who is our MC for the day, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Liz. Um, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Renee Moran, who is Professor of Pomology with the University of Maine School of Food and Agriculture and also with Cooperative Extension. Her specialties are tree fruit production with an emphasis on cold hardiness of fruit trees, variety trials, and optimizing production of honey crisp. Renee, it's over to you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I've agreed to talk about some of the research I've been doing, and I would like to point out that some of this is preliminary at this stage. Um, for about 20 years now, I've been working with the variety Honeycrisp, which has a, a number of storage disorders, and um, I'm hoping slowly we can find a solution to uh, completely preventing them. Um, the last two years, I've been testing some methods of predicting bitter pit and soft scald in Honeycrisp, doing this with the Apple team at Highmore Farm, Greg Kohler and Pete Lugner, and using apples from Ricker Hill Orchards and Cooper Farms. I'd also like to point out that this has uh, been a multi-state collaboration, also with some uh, Canadian provinces. It's a big project and we like to work together so hopefully um, this collaboration will speed up the, the results of this research. 
So uh, before I get into the research, uh, just a quick review. Bitter pit shows up at the calyx end and it's these indentations. And to prevent it, we, it's if recommended that we store apples at 32 degrees. Uh, but this is way too cold for Honeycrisp. When we do that, it develops chilling injury of soft scald and soggy breakdown. And that's why we store it at a warmer temperature of about 37 degrees. So we're stuck with um, the problem of bitter pit. And it's because of this inability to store this variety at uh, the cooler temperatures that we've been uh, struggling with this problem. Um, uh, the additional calcium sprays are helpful, but have not been enough to prevent bitter pit. I've heard people recommending that we reduce the potassium fertilizer, but I'm not one of the people who recommends this because potassium is essential for good fruit color and flavor. And the whole point of growing Honeycrisp is its high consumer appeal. And potassium is essential for good fruit quality. Um, a few months ago, we had a presentation by uh, Jennifer DL, who's been studying the same problems. And um, I'm hoping that her, um, so, um, her uh, she's been testing CA conditions during pre-storage conditioning, and this has been showing some possible benefit. Um, I'm not sure if it's ready for uh, commercial application yet. I've been doing research uh, with rootstocks, and yes, some rootstocks have shown consistently that they um, have grow fruit with less bitter pit, but um, that's the long-term solution, and we have a problem right now that we need to deal with. So um, we're um, at the stage where instead of being able to completely prevent it, perhaps we can figure out which orchards have the greatest risk and segregate these fruit at harvest or shortly thereafter. So how do we know which orchards are at high risk? Um, several years ago, Penn State started doing peel analysis and this has been helpful for identifying high risk orchards. And it's simply uh, slicing off apple peels three weeks before harvest and sending them to the lab and hopefully you get your results by the time you have apples ready to go into storage. This works best if you combine it with measurements of shoot length, finding the orchards where the average shoot length is greater than 15 inches uh, adds a, another layer of knowledge to which orchards are at risk. Um, so in 2019, I started doing work on the passive test and this, um, is basically harvesting apples three weeks before harvest, keeping them at warm temperatures to try to induce bitter pit so that we um, know which orchards are risk, uh, high risk by the time we harvest the apples. Last year, I started doing um, what I call the freezer test to see which orchards are at high risk for soft scald. And this um, entails putting apples into a freezer not necessarily freezing the apples, but I have a freezer that gives me good control over temperatures. And I put the apples in at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And within three weeks, um, apples from certain orchards start to develop soft scald. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the passive test is being led by Chris Watkins and Al Shof, but it's also being done in several other locations. Three weeks before harvest, I flag 10 trees and I harvest 100 apples from um, a, um, a composite sample from all 10 trees. And I did, did this in um, eight orchards in the last two years. These apples were held at about 70 degrees for three weeks. And uh, by the uh, end of the third week, they, you start to see signs of bitter pit. And you can see in the photograph, some of these apples have signs of bitter pit and maybe some have stink bug. So this helped me identify some high risk orchards. Um, half the apples were conditioned, the other half went straight into cold storage. I tested two storage temperatures, 34 and 37 degrees, and the apples were three months in storage. This is from uh, 2019, where I had um, uh, 
these are the apples from Maine primarily. And um, this is the bitter pit in uh, fruit that was at 37 degrees and had been conditioned for a week. Um, it tended to overestimate bitter pit in some orchards. Most of the orchards had about 10% or less, but one orchard had quite a lot of bitter pit in this year. And then uh, the apples that were not conditioned, uh, similar results, except that one high risk orchard had uh, more bitter pit without conditioning, which to me was somewhat confusing. So um, it wasn't very accurate in telling us which orchards had um, moderate amounts or low amounts, but it did help us pick out the, the worst case scenario. And then with uh, the colder temperatures, um, one of the orchards, that high risk orchard had a lot of bitter pit, whereas with the reduction in the storage temperature, uh, there was also a reduction in bitter pit. So uh, last year, um, I tested another eight orchards and thought that there was a good prediction in um, estimating the amount of bitter pit that occurred in cold storage. Um, this graph shows the uh, apple, bitter pit in apples that were at 37 degrees with and without conditioning. Um, a couple of high risk orchards were identified and um, the predictability down in this range where it's below 20% wasn't that good. And um, again, um, the conditioning seemed to reduce bitter pit in some orchards, but not all. Renee, excuse me, we have a question on what is conditioning. Maybe you could go over that sure. again. Um, conditioning is uh, um, where you hold the apples at ambient temperatures, 50 to 70 degrees for five to seven days before you put them in cold storage. This vastly reduces their chilling injury. Um, but uh, some people think it increases bitter pit. And my research um, uh, shows that it doesn't necessarily increase bitter pit. And in some cases, these symptoms are actually reduced. But I'm, uh, I'm happy that uh, with the results, um, this passive test allowed me to identify some high risk orchards and um, allows me to, uh, the grower I worked with last year uh, knew ahead of time and was able to um, keep these apples out of cold storage and sell them right away. So um, again, the bitter pit was uh, worse with the warm storage compared to the 34 degrees, but I'm not recommending a storage of 34 degrees at this time because the, the risk for um, chilling injury is too great. But um, I still have a question about whether or not some of these uh, symptoms of bitter pit are actually bitter pit. Um, and some things I find at harvest are uh, these water soaked spots. This is an extreme case, just below the surface of the peel. And um, then um, symptoms uh, in the apple on the left, which um, isn't classic bitter pit. And, um, I'm hoping uh, my colleagues can um, educate me on this disorder. So um, I also put apples into cold storage to see how much soft scald develops with and without conditioning. And uh, my um, conclusion is still that uh, with conditioning, 34 degrees is still too cold for honey crisp. And uh, it wasn't um, enough to prevent soft scald in half the orchards. Um, so um, the next phase of this research was uh, asking the question, can I predict the risk of soft scald? Um, I have a programmable freezer that I use for cold hardiness testing and it goes down to minus 40 but uh, it allows me to control the temperature at the high range. And so I used it at harvest. I picked 30 apples from uh, several orchards, put them at the freeze in the freezer at about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 
and then uh, watched soft skull develop. And after three weeks, I was able to uh, segregate the orchards according to their risk. I had to closely monitor the temperature to prevent the freezing, which would interfere with my ability to pick out uh, soft scald. And three weeks into the experiment, actually two and a half weeks, I started to see signs of uh, early soft scald, which looks a lot like a bruise. And uh, I did this in seven, seven of the orchards that I tested last year and uh, found that soft scald was underestimated with the freezer test, but there was a good predictability in fruit that went straight into cold storage without conditioning. Um, that would be this, this data here. With conditioning, there was some soft scald in two of these seven orchards and uh, storing them at warm temperature without condition with conditioning was the best method for um, preventing um, soft scald. So I'm still recommending a 37 degree storage temperature with conditioning. So uh, this is the conclusion of the two years of research I've done. I think it's important to pay attention to uh, shoot length in your orchards and uh, keep good control of the nitrogen because high nitrogen is associated with um, severe bitter pit. And if possible, do the peel analysis before harvest. This is something I'm going to see if our um, analytical lab at the University of Maine can do for me and hopefully um, for um, commercial orchards in the years to come. And then with these passive, this passive test, I think it's important to be skeptical because we're still in the early stages of research and there is some inaccuracy in this um, test, but I found it to be very helpful for picking out the worst orchards. So um, I highly recommend that if you wanna use this method, test it first to make sure that it's going to work for your operation. That's all I have, unless there are questions. I want to know if those treat those apples were treated with retain or smart fresh. None of the apples in my research were treated with retain or smart fresh. Really? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Renee, so is the peel analysis that's not available yet? Or is there a lab that's doing that already? Or Penn State has been doing that test. You get your kit um, several weeks ahead of time, send them to the Penn State Analytical Lab, and hopefully get your results by the time you harvest the apples. We have an analytical lab at the University of Maine, and um, I'm going to talk to some of the people there and see if they can get set up to do this for us. I think the big limitation would be that the, all the wild blueberry samples would be in analysis at the time that we need the lab. Is Penn State's test available to anybody and how much does it cost? I don't know and I don't know. I tried to find it on their website and um, I don't have much information, but um, we're a long ways from harvest, so I have some time to work this out. And can you distinguish soft scald versus storage scald. I, I get those two mixed up. So uh, soft scald is very different from superficial scald. And um, superficial scald affects primarily just the peel. Soft scald is um, the flesh underneath turns brown. I can show you some photographs later, but honey crisp is not susceptible to superficial scald. Okay, getting back to the rootstock question. Yeah, uh, Bud 10, Geneva 214, and one other uh, show less susceptibility to bitter pit. I don't necessarily like the rootstock Geneva 214 because of uh, some things I've seen with fruit quality and the tendency to overset fruit. So it becomes extremely biennial. But bud 10, I do like, and I wish I could remember the other rootstock. So vigorous rootstocks like Geneva 30 have been showing. Um, thank you. It, I think it was 969. When, when I'm harvesting these apples in the rootstock trial, we have to measure tree pit at the beginning of, 
um, during harvest. And this is bitter pit symptoms that show up at harvest. And uh, I have noticed that where I have two fruits set in one cluster, there's a greater tendency for tree pit to show up. So I think thinning is uh, important in um, preventing some of these problems. Renee, this is Glenn Morin. Um, when you talk about identifying high risk blocks, are you talking about um, historically high risk blocks or does that can that change from year to year depending on growing conditions and therefore you have to uh, perform that each season? I recommend doing it each season until you're confident that the orchard is going to stay high risk or you're confident that the orchard is not going to develop risk. Now, I think it's too early in this research to um, confidently say that uh, this test is going to um, uh, permanently label an orchard as high risk. Bitter pit. Uh, Bitter pit. Part of the peel analysis is measuring the ratio of nitrogen to calcium. And if there's too much nit nitrogen in relation to calcium, there's a good chance of severe bitter pit. Okay. And we got a new question. Okay. When conditioning, what is occurring in the honey crisp? Um, no one really knows what goes on inside the apple that prevents chilling injury. But um, it's probably related to some metabolism and, and to dissipation of bad metabolites. It was, I just agree with what you said. Okay, great, thanks Jennifer. <laughs> Somebody's asking about uh, bitter pit at the cellular level. And um, we, uh, we're understanding it better in tomatoes uh, than we are in apples. And the answer is yes to that question. Um, I think with the tomatoes, it has to do with how the calcium moves in and out of the cell during early development. But um, my colleague Beth Mitchum has been unable to do this research with apples. Thanks for all your great questions. Well, what I'm gonna do is talk about ag radar first, which is the end product. And then if for with time that we have left, um, loop back and talk about the weather stuff. Um, this is the website where ag radar um, lives. And these are the sites we ran in 2018. We were offline for 2019 and 2020 because the weather data that I needed to run Ag Radar ceased to be available because Skybit Incorporated got bought out and are no longer in business. So what we've been doing is um, reinventing that system, which is why we've been offline for the last two years. But we got the system back working, and um, so it'll be online this year. Just a couple of uh, context points is that, you know, weather has always been an issue for tree fruit growers and farmers in general. And with the weather changing, it's getting even more important to keep track of what's going on, especially with the, the change in extremes and the variability seems to be increasing too, at least with precipitation. So as part of another project um, last year, we surveyed apple growers in Maine for what they wanted. And the main thing that came up was they wanted ag radar back. And they also wanted notifications about weather events and pest forecasting and also the effect of weather on their pesticide intervals, you know, the residue degradation. Um, longer range forecast. And, and then they also wanted the ability to enter their own data into the models to get a customized um, output. Three out of four ain't bad. So we're going to have three of those going this year. The fourth thing is something we're working on. Um, I don't know if it's going to show up this year or not. So what happened when Skybit went out was actually before it went out. Um, i have been paying Skybit for weather data. I was one of their first customers and I'd been paying them for 25 years for multiple sites. And it wasn't too much, but it was, you know, it's money and it added up. Um, and when Skybit first started, it was groundbreaking because nobody had done that before. Um, 
the guy that started Skybit, I know him, I met him in grad school and um, he basically invented the weather grid. So I had a great relationship with him, but money is money. And after a while, I, things that technology had advanced and I figured, well, why can't we just do this ourselves? Because the, weather, the NOAA, National Weather Service is using the weather grid. And I saw Joe at a meeting and I said, Joe, you know, it's great working with you all these years, but why would I keep paying you if I can get it for free? And he said, well, you're gonna find out getting it for free is not as easy as you think. And he was right. So we kept going with Skybit because um, we had a great thing going there. And then when they got bought out, Joe called me and said, you, you get what Skybit's about. I hate to see this thing go under and I got customers that I hate to throw under the bus. So why don't you take it over? And I and so we did. And I told Joe, I said he would help out with some contacts in the in the weather industry. They wouldn't charge, you know, they'd give us a good price and all that. And I said, well, Joe, that's great, but I saw this coming. And I had met a guy, Sean Burkle here, picture here is our state climatologist. He runs a thing called Climate Reanalyzer, which is pretty well known around the world. And he pulls down data from all these weather grids and does the whole planet. Now he's not doing the ag stuff or wasn't doing the local detail that we needed for ag radar, but he certainly had the skills. So we had begun working on this whole thing um, a couple of years ahead of time. So when Skybit went under and working with Joe, um, we, um, we created this thing called Ag Radar Weather, which has been in operation for over a year now. We just haven't gone live for commercial services or running the main sites until this year because we wanted to get everything lined up before we we're exposing ourselves and we want to make sure we hit it right. So that's that's where we're at with Ag Radar Weather. So that's replacing Skybit. And now because of that, we have a data source to run the Ag Radar again. So that's why we're back in operation. I've got a bunch of slides here about how all that works. I'm going to skip ahead, <coughs> excuse me, and just get right to the, um, the outputs. So again, that's what that's the site where it's going to be living. Um, we have 79 weather sites in Maine. I am not going to run, run 79 ag radar sites for Apple um, this year, but I'll probably run um, about as many as you see here on Maine on the on the left side there. And just quickly, how it works is we get the weather data. It's all automated. Um, the, we, you couldn't possibly do this, you know, just banging the keyboard, you, you'd die. So we have scripts that grab the weather data and bring it into Excel. The Excel has been set up for each site to import the weather data and apply it to that site's um, settings. And the settings for that site include the biofixes for green tip, half inch green, king bloom, and petal fall. And I use those dates because the, um, the pest forecast and the disease forecast, as you well know, if you're an apple grower, are largely tied to the bud stage. That has a great effect on when things happen and how, what the significance of it is. So it does take a little bit of hands-on to run each site um, to keep, to enter those biofixes and, um, make sure that that site is on track. So then the scripts, um, Excel does its thing. And then the, the results are published as tables and charts to the web. And so growers have access, single click access to the models and the tables and charts that they wanna see. And so now I'm just gonna run through um, what the products are. So this is uh, Monmouth, Maine is Highmore Farm Agricultural Research Station. That's Maine's um, orchard research station. And there's a long list of products. And the thing to keep in mind here is you don't need to look at everything every day. We are um, working to 
one thing people don't like is there's just so much stuff they don't know what to look at. It's kind of based on their preposition that an apple grower knows that, you know, early in the season, they need to be looking at apple scab and they don't really need to be looking at fly speck that much. Whereas late in the summer, you're looking at fly speck and you're not so much worried about apple scab. So they're all just there and you have to figure out, you know, which ones you want to look at. Um, but we could do more about identifying at each stage of the season, what are the critical things? And that is something we can do. But right now I'm going to show you just the full list. So beginning of the season, apple scab is of primary concern and primary apple scab is the uh, sexual stage of apple scab when the spores are releasing and starting the new infections for the year. So we've got several um, tables and charts that deal with that. And I'll show you examples in a minute here. This is just the list of the products. And then, so that, that's the biology of the scab. It's ascospore maturity and things like that. Um, and cumulative risk. This gets into the fungicide protection. And just the, these tables and charts show if you apply, if your last fungicide application was applied on this date, here is when that coverage is likely to wear off and when you need to reapply again. And again, I'll show examples in a minute. Hey, Glenn. Yep. We have a question wondering um, when you may have a site in New Hampshire. Um, we can do, when I, when I get to the weather stuff, we can do any site in the continental US. We're doing it, we're providing the weather data for free for Maine sites. So we got 79 sites in Maine. We have a hundred customers that we picked up from Skybit out as far as, um, well, I we got Illinois, Indiana, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, a bunch of strawberry growers down there. Um, we had one guy in Arizona, we cut him off because we didn't feel comfortable doing weather in Arizona because it's just so different out there. But we're doing basically everything. We're doing the whole continental US technically. We feel more comfortable doing everything east of the Rockies. So yes, there can be a New Hampshire site. The main sites for free, at least for this year, we figured why not? Because you know, main taxpayers help give Sean and I a job. So that's part of the payback. Skybit was not doing it for free. Um, so we are charging um, growers outside of Maine 140 bucks a year. This gets into a longer discussion, but 140 bucks a year will get you a, um, an ag radar weather site. And then to run ag radar tools, which is all the stuff I'm showing here, is another 200 bucks. So Skybit was charging 60 bucks a month for the weather, we're charging 140 bucks for the whole year. And if you only want just the growing season, we'll knock that back to 120. And we're, we're gonna be making an announcement soon about those subscription services. It's all through the University of Maine Department of Industrial Cooperation. And there's a subscription page and you put your credit card in and give us your site coordinates, you know, your latitude, longitude, and we're off to the races. And if, again, if you want ag radar, um, let's see, the extra 200 bucks and you need to give me those bio fixes. Is that, is that, <laughs> is that enough too much? That's great. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. If you have questions about the um, Ag Radar service, um, you can send me an email and we can, we can talk. Or... So after scab, um, you know, you get into the summer, you're looking at fly speck and sooty blotch. Um, I just call it fly speck here because the models that I use here are all based on fly spec. The fly spec and sooty blotch is a biological mess. There's up, they're up to about 90 species now. So calling it one thing is a little bit problematic, but this is based on the major fly spec uh, species. It's a fungus. Um, and again, this gets into if you sprayed on this date, here's when you need to spray again, basically, and how long you can feel like you're safe before fly spec can show up. So, you know, when you're going to harvest the apples compared to when the risk is going to show up. And there's a bunch of insect stuff, of course. And the first one is sort of a, 
um, a calendar abbreviated list of key dates for codling moth. Um, um, boars, lesser apple worm, mullein plant bug, oriental fruit moth, oblique banded leaf roller, red banded leaf roller, San Jose scale, spotted teniform leaf miner, tarnished plant bug, and white apple leaf hopper. And then we got more detailed things about plum cuculeo, um, biological, and also the chemical control, coddling moth, and there's actually some more cottony moth things that aren't even shown on this list here because cottony moth's gotten really complicated with all these new chemistries. You've got growth regulators and ovicides um, that you need to put on at an earlier growth stage or an earlier development stage than you do the, the traditional insecticide. So some of them need to go on at 100 degree days after egg hatch. Some need to go on 150, some 200 and some 250. And, sometimes even 350. So we keep track of all that stuff and that is shown in the tables um, and the charts. Apple maggot, same kind of thing. When did you spray and when do you need to spray again? European red mite <coughs> is the key biological dates of when they have um, generational synchrony up to about the third generation, but especially the first two generations. So it tells you the best time to monitor I think IPM has been guilty of thinking growers have time to do IPM as if it's that's how they make money and they don't. So this identifies what's the best time to be scouting for mites. It's easy to say, well, scout for mites every week. Well, that's, yeah, sure, it would be, it is better. But if you've got a limited number of uh, times you want to be in the orchard scouting, this helps identify what those times are. And it isn't just, um, pest because there's some horticultural things we can keep track of too. The bud stage, these are based on Macintosh. Um, could do a Honeycrisp model here. Um, in fact, I talked with um, <coughs> Randy Beaudry at Michigan State. He's doing a Honeycrisp um, developmental model this year. So hopefully we can get that rolling soon. Um, and of course, growers on this call or webinar realize that, you know, chemical thinning activity is highly sensitive to the weather. So we've got a, a tables and charts that show the, the past and forecast, especially weather, how that is likely to affect uh, thinner sensitivity. So to help pick that optimum window um, for putting on your thinners and help adjust the rates and some stuff about harvest dates. I've also got other um, cultivars for harvest dates, which don't show on this list here. <coughs> so just the big picture is we're doing, you know, the big three diseases um, and then the major apple pest there, especially, um, I didn't mention round-headed apple tree borer. That is the, uh, the bane of backyard apple production, Maine. I don't know how else, how it is in the rest of New England, but they take out about half the trees that get planted, um, sometimes more. My neighbor lost 15 out of 18 trees. Um, so that's the big picture of what we're doing. And then besides the pest stuff, um, I forgot to mention there's a honeybee activity model. Um, so it just shows on any given day how active the honeybees are going to be. It's not necessarily that you're not going to spray if you need to spray, but it might can give you more incentive to spray at night instead of during the day or to mow the clover in the alleyways before you spray or something like that. We've also added evapotranspiration and to help with irrigation scheduling and the rain surplus and deficit. So some of the products. So this is just basically the weather forecast. So Ag Radar has its own weather charts and, and it's just a little more attuned to what growers need to see for their spraying operations. So what you see here is the yellow is the sunshine for each day. It shows you which days are cloudy. So this is the cloudy day here and which days have a lot of sun. Of course that affects thinning and a lot of other things. The dark blue is the rain per hour. If it's a 
cross hatched, you know, the dotted blue, that's light showers that may or may not actually be there. The um, temperature is the, the red, hourly temperatures are in the red there. And the wind speed is the, uh, the dotted purple line. And so, you know, your scale for your wind speeds over here. So this um, flat line here is 10 miles per hour. You really don't want to be spraying over 10 miles per hour. So that just shows you which hours are above that threshold. Um, this is the 24 hour chance of precip in the forecast. All the weather data is also um, stored in tables. So if you did want to see the hourly details, uh, you can go to the weather table and, and look it up. On the, the ag radar system, ag radar weather, sorry, um, Sean has better charts actually that are interactive charts um, that you can click on any point and get the full report for that hour. This is a, a three week summary of the weather. So this is the green bar is today's date. So this was, this was captured off the screen grab on September 22nd. And um, it just shows these are the forecast temperatures, you know, for the coming uh, nine days ahead. These are the highs and the lows for each day. And the, the, the uh, colored band in the middle here, those are the climatic average temperatures for those dates for that site. So we have the average climatology at two kilometer resolution for the whole continental US. So this just helps you, you know, kind of keep in your mind, is it, is it warmer than average? Is this, you know, warm weather or is this cool weather? So, you know, you see here, it's a little warmer on average that day. And actually that night is, didn't get very cool at all. And then it just shows the last um, three weeks before that, just as context to, um, you know, help remind you about what the weather was doing prior to that. So it will certainly been above average warmth um, from this slide here. Same kind of thing for precipitation. This one's a little bit busy, but once you get used to looking at these things, they become, um, you, don't, you don't have to read them, you just see it and you get it. So I'm gonna just walk you through some of the things here. And again, just keep in mind that once you get used to it, it, it is a lot easier. Um, so the dark blue is the daily precipitation. Again, it's here's today's date. These are all forecast. This is all observations. And then the, uh, the purple line is the cumulative precipitation. So over the whole period. And the black line is the uh, cumulative precipitation for the last 10 days. The little star things here are the chance of precip on each one of these forecast days. And the blue bars again are the amount of precipitation forecast for each of those days. So these are some of the, the model outputs is probably what people are more interested in because you can get weather data other places. And like I said, the ag radar weather um, service charts are more sophisticated and they're interactive. You can click on them and get hourly data for any point. So this is this is the main reason I started Ag Radar because I was constantly on the phone with growers talking about degree days and how much it rained since they last sprayed and you know where we were at with apple scab. So this takes in account ascospore maturity in addition to the amount of leaf tissue and the sensitivity of that leaf tissue and generates a risk value for apple scab infection based on the weather and the growth stage at any day during the season. And so this shows the whole scab season for that year in retrospect. Um, as you're going through the year, of course, you don't know what the weather's gonna be. So it would, that, um, there would be a line showing you where the forecast, where the observations end and what, which is observations and which is forecast. In this case here, I, I didn't grab the thing until in September, but it's all observations. So you don't see that distinction between forecast and observation. There is a line showing um, the difference between forecast and observations. So anyway, so this is the risk for each day. And it just shows that all scab infection periods are not created equal. 
I mean, this is an infection period, but to be really, I've been watched um, unsprayed orchards and until the infection potential gets up to about 5%, even in an unsprayed orchard, you don't see many scab lesions show up from an infection. So it's really when you get to, you know, at least a level like this or above that it really matters. The other bars, so there's uncertainty with any kind of estimate. You don't know exactly um, which growth stage you're at. You don't know exactly how many degree days are gonna be there, you know, based on the forecast uncertainty. So these other bars just show the range of uncertainty within that estimate. So the big red bar is the best guess. And then the, the, uh, the orangish bars show the, and the black bars show the, the range of 95% certainty for any given estimate. There is a question in the chat about how accurate the spore maturity values are, if you wanna address that as well. <laughs> Spore maturity values, they're useful at the beginning of the season and they're really useful at the end of the season, the estimates of ascospore maturity. In the middle of primary scab, estimates of ascospore maturity are pretty terrible, but that doesn't matter because once scab primary season has started, you're really not playing games with you know, what exact level it's at. And that's, that's built into the uncertainty I showed in that previous slide. Again, the ascospore maturity estimates are pretty good. They're, they're okay early in the season. I think they're quite very good at the end of the primary scab season, you know, a couple of weeks, a week or two after petal fall. Primary scab, this is another view of primary scab. Um, this, this is the cumulative throughout the whole season. So the red bar shows how much of primary scab risk has already been expressed. In other words, have those spores been released and they've had time to um, you know, do their thing? Where are we at with towards the end of primary scab season? And so it just shows that it doesn't go up. It goes up in spurts with the rain. So you can have a lot of scab potential build up with heat units and until those heat units are released, uh, you know, with a scab spore release with rain, that's when your risk goes up. So the ascospore maturity and the uh, sort of the potential is this smooth orange line. And that's just a, a function of ascospore maturity and tissue growth and tissue sensitivity. So that's kind of a theoretical line, but the red line doesn't catch up to it until you get a rain to let those spores fly and do their infection process. So that's why it goes up in this stair-step fashion. I told you about, you know, there's tables that show you when you last sprayed, when you need to spray again. So this is an example there. So you look up the date that you last sprayed. So let's say you last sprayed on May 2nd, and this shows you how much rain has occurred since then. So if you're looking at this on, you know, May 10th, it would say, well, there's been, you know, 96 hundredths of an inch of rain since then. And, th and this tells you when that fungicide protection wore off. Now this particular table is based, it's, it's fungicide dependent. So this particular table is based on Captan, Mancozeb, SDHIs and psyllids. So these are protected fungicides. There are different tables for the strobilian fungicides, Sovran, Flint, and Pristine. And then there's um, different table for the uh, sterile inhibitor, the DMI fungicides, such as um, Inspire Super, Indar, you know, that whole family. But getting back to this one, so if you use Captan on May 2nd, this says your fungicide wore off on May 11th. Now, the assumption is that you sprayed at 6 a.m. So if you sprayed late at night on May 2nd, you'd probably want to use the May 3rd instead of the May 2nd. And then if you did go into an infection period um, unprotected, this shows you how much, when the end date for the post-infection kickback activity is for that material. If, if you were not protected going into the May 11th infection period. So this date here is the next time when there was infection potential started. 
this is a table and you saw that chart of the different infection periods, you know, those red bars of how high they were. Well, this is that same, inf same information in table form. And it just shows that, you know, the first real infection period in this particular site, this is Belchertown in 2014, was a, an infection period of 17%. And that 17% means what percentage of the season's total primary scab infection potential. So basically one fifth of the season's scab, primary scab infection potential was released at Pink on Saturday, May 10th at Belchertown in 2014. All right, more apple scab. So, you know, you can slice and dice these things a lot of different ways, which I think is really interesting and useful. So we say, you know, you should go out and check for scab lesions. Well, of course you should, but it's like the mite thing I was talking about earlier. It's not like growers have, you know, free time to be doing stuff that isn't useful. There's no real point of looking for apple scab in this case before May 23rd, because the lesions have not had time to show up yet. So why go out there and look? You're just wasting your time. So this shows you, you know, the first date when the first generation primary scab lesions have had time to show up. And, and as each infection period, you know, per, that it had occurred a couple of weeks earlier has had time to develop lesions, this shows you that's that same stair step, stair step but this time it's, it's for the lesions, not for the infection potential being expressed. So what I have found at Highmore is, um, I got burned one year because I was checking for all the primary scab lesions. <coughs> and my, you know, my recommendation at that time was, well, if you've checked, if all the primary scab lesions have had time to show up and you're not seeing any lesions, then you're done with primary scab. You can let your fungicide protection relax and you know, move on to other things. But it's not that simple because what can happen in bigger trees, especially this may not be, apply so much with these new smaller trees that you can see basically the whole tree. But if you've got um, trees where there's a lot of canopy over your head, unless you're climbing the tree, which I don't do anymore, I hurt my back too many times jumping out of trees. Um, so there's, there could be scab up in that upper canopy from first generation that you're not seeing from the ground. And what can happen is a little bit of scab up in the top of the canopy becomes, does not become visible until it's had been rained on and spread as secondary scab. And that's the purple um, areas here, the purple bars. So my recommendation now is you're really not safe from primary scab until you've had time for all the secondary scab lesions to show up. And if you still don't have visible scab by then, then you can relax about apple scab. So, and it makes it a later, which is kind of a drag, but it just shows you that, you know, for this site, Belchertown, you really couldn't confirm that you were, you had controlled primary scab until after the third week of June, because that's how much time it would take for secondary scab lesions to show up. Fire blight is certainly in the news these days. And this is the um, cougar blight model. I also run um, the Mary blight model. I think I'm only gonna show the cougar blight here on, in terms of a chart. But so cougar blight, one thing I like about cougar blight is you can set your threshold according to the history of the orchard. Of the fire blight history of the orchard. So if you've got, you know, active fire blight in the orchard or very nearby, then you've got a very low threshold because you know you've got an oculum. If you're more intermediate, then you can stand 200 heat units of fire blight risk. And if there's never been a history of fire blight in that orchard, you can be even using an even lower threshold of 500. And so this just shows the heat units for each um, cougar blight infection period relative to those different thresholds. The dotted bars show the number of heat units, but they're not filled in red because it didn't rain that day. And as most of you know, you need some moisture um, to launch fire blight. However, it doesn't take much moisture at all. And it doesn't even take measurable rain. Um, very high humidity 
can also launch it. So that's the red dotted bars are showing, you know, June 1st here. That's that's a kind of a nightmare situation. So even if it didn't rain, I'd, I'd be protected against fire blight on that day. Because any any dude that launched, let that fire blight happen um, would be disastrous. Though compared to um, the heat units they had last year in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, um, they, were, they were even worse than that. That was unbelievable last year. So again, this is cougar blight, and it just shows, you know, you've got that low, medium, and high sensitivity, and it just shows the date, um, what the rating was for that day. And so the more sensitive is going to have the higher rating. So on May 26th here, in a low fire blight orchard um, without any history, you wouldn't even need to have, have protection. But if you've got any history of fire blight, um, it was an extreme infection period. And, and if, if you got a, you know, active fire blight in the orchard, it was exceptionally bad. This is plum cuculio. They're very sensitive to the weather. They don't like hot, and dry. they don't like dry. And they have to conserve their body moisture. And they're also um, more active at night. This table here is rates their level of activity. If your coverage ran out on June 5th, I wouldn't be too worried about getting covered up again right away because June 6th was apparently too cold for them to be doing much anyway. So you weren't going to get much damage that night. But if you ran out on you know June 11th, um, there's a fair amount of activity that you know in the following couple of days so you'd want to have protection and certainly you know if you ran out on june 17th um, you might want to be more concerned this is pesticide residue depletion for plum cuculio so this just shows if you last sprayed on june 1st based on the the uh, basically the rain um, here's one that protection is um, presumed to have worn off this table here is for imidan. If you sprayed on June 1st, your protection is probably pretty good until June 13th. And this shows here, well, what is, how does June 13th compare to the whole plum cuculeo overposition period? And the uh, New York plum cuculeo degree day model says you need to stay protected until 305 degree days after petal fall. And so because you got a petal fall biofix entered into this model, it knows that 305 degree days after petal fall is going to be around um, June 24th. And so June 13th is only 56% of the way towards that date. So you've got basically, you know, uh, almost half of the plum cuculeo risk period remaining. So this tells you, look, you sprayed June 1st, it wore off June 13th but you've got a long way to go before plum cuculeo is no longer a risk. So you'd want to spray again. But if you sprayed on June 10th, um, these dates are probably late, especially if you're New York growers, but this is Monmouth, Maine. Everything's a little bit later than what you guys are used to. Um, if you last sprayed on June 10th, you're in the clear because that coverage, that residue is expected to remain good until June 24th. And that, that takes you to the end of the plum cuculeo egg laying period. This is a similar thing for apple maggot. Um, so if you last sprayed on August 1st, it says that, and this is based, these residue um, wear off dates here are based on work done by John Wise at Michigan State. He found that different um, insecticides had different residual activity against apple maggot. And it's based on the chemistry of the pesticide in terms of how it wears off and how it interacts with the plant cuticle, but it also depends on the tox toxicity, the raw toxicity to the, to the pest also. Hey Glenn, would you, could you take a minute and, and sort of briefly summarize the differences between, that may exist between previous versions of AgRadar and this new version? Um, better weather data. We're, we're doing much better than what Skyvit did. did. Um, 
you got higher resolution and it's just because the weather technology has moved ahead. Um, but other than that, um, for now, it's basically I'm picking up where I left off with ag radar in 2018. So other than the weather information, it's basically the same models that we're used to being able to use. Correct. Um, have there been any tweaks to the models that um, are currently in there? There's been some updated models because I got stuff from some new model information to tweak some of the models. Yes, but nothing radical. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is the European red mite. Again, I, I told you earlier. Yeah, you can check for mites every week, but you know maybe you got other better things to do. So this identifies the optimum sample period for petal fall or for red mites is from petal fall till June second, and the petal fall is based on the uh, either the forecast or the observed petal fall date. So what we're seeing here is between May twenty sixth and June second, those are the best dates to go check your red mite situation. And the June 2nd is because we have a mite model in there that estimates when that first generation of European red mites are going to be sexually mature and laying eggs. And if you're going to control first generation red mites, you really want to do it before they lay those eggs. Because once they lay those eggs, you got a whole nother batch of mites that are coming out after you. And so you want to kill them before they lay those eggs. Glenn, we've got a couple of questions. Yeah. So first of all, um, for quick reference, during the growing season, how and where can you find these tables? Um, the second question was, will the AgRadar tools be available for sign up for this year? Um, and if so, approximately when? And I have a third question, but I'd like to let you answer those first two first. You will be able to find them at that web, at that web address. OK, and the other one was, if and when will we be able to sign up for these tools? Well, the if is yes, um, or else I won't have to worry about it because the main apple growers will string me up from a tree because <laughs> they're not happy that I didn't have it online for the last two years. Um, I just didn't have the weather data to run it. So, but now I do. So yes, it will be available this year. We're shooting for April 1st. So yeah, we'll be putting it out in the newsletter. Okay, and I and of course I'll share that with folks. And we do have a question, and this is going to bring you um, to the weather information. How is site specificity of weather assured for any site if one subscribes to the radar system, the ag radar system? So the question is about how spatially specific is it? This is, yeah. How how is that site specificity assured for the weather information? NOAA has satellites, uh, multiple satellites. They got radars, ground radars, checking the, you know, the rain clouds and all that. They got, you know, radio uh, balloons going up. They got ground stations all over the place, professionally maintained ground stations, high quality stuff with duplicate sensors and aspirated temperature and shielded temperature and all that. So they take all that data, they throw it into a big pot it's called a supercomputer. And that supercomputer basically creates a simulated earth. And this is where all your forecast information comes from. So when the TV guy is talking about what the weather's gonna be, he's pulling the same stuff that we're pulling. And that, that representative earth has a box for every grid cell on the planet, okay? And the grids, this is what's happened since Skybit you know, Skybit started in 1994, I think. And this is how things have evolved um, resolution wise since then. I'm just scrolling through these. Um, we're down to 1.65. One, this is wrong. It's 1.5 miles now. We're at 1.5 mile resolution. So there is a box on that earth for every 1.5 mile square, you know, box. And so if your orchard is one mile from your neighbor, you both don't you both don't need to get ag radar weather because you're going to get essentially the same information. Um, so the resolution is at 1.5 miles for the near term forecast, which goes out 60 hours. Um, and then beyond that, we use the global forecast system, which has 18 mile resolution. But once you get to three days, 
the forecast itself has enough you know variation in it that you don't need 1.6 mile resolution because it, it's, it's no different um, and then the observations the NOAA collects all the observations again throws them into a supercomputer and they build a thing called the it's called the initialization and that's another earth and that's what they use to start their forecast model run and that is also at 1.5 miles so it's all gridded does that answer the question right so i want to just make sure that i'm i'm personally because i'm interested in this as well what i'm understanding is that what happens is there is a there's historical site specific weather information that is from ob years worth of observations there's satellite information and then there's the network of various weather stations around and all of that information gets collected and plopped into the supercomputer, which then is able to give us an estimated forecast to spatial resolution of about a mile and a half. Is, is that fair? a fair summary? Right, now let me give you an example. Just, okay. I don't know if, if there's any New York growers hanging in there, they're probably all gone. Let's say, let's use a Massachusetts example. Mm -hmm. If it's 50 degrees in Belchertown, okay, and it's 46 degrees in Amherst, and you know the topography and you know how the weather you know is different elevation and wind patterns and proximity to the ocean and proximity to the Quabbin reservoir and all that good stuff you throw all that physics at it and say look it was 46 and i got a good you know professional weather station run by NOAA and amherst and, and i got data showing that it was 46 degrees there and i got data from the satellites and other things showing that that uh, belcher town was 50 and you're in between those two sites the grid would say look you're 10 miles from amherst and you're i don't know how, how far those two apart are and you're 20 miles from belcher town you're halfway in between them almost your temperature was probably 48. it's based on again you know the topography elevation all the you know all the wind patterns where the clouds were at that you know maybe the clouds were over belcher town at that moment and they weren't over amherst so amherst was a little bit warmer mm -hmm. well if if the cloud you know mapping showed that the clouds weren't over you either you'd be more like amherst you know it's all thrown in there in fact it's not just it's not just taking an average between distance can so yes can several growers get uh, weather emails from the same site and can a group of growers share one ag radar site yeah, we need to talk. We're, we've been giving um, the answer is sort of yes. Um, the weather, the, we've been delivering the email by, we would, excuse me, we have been delivering the weather to growers as online charts and tables. There's also a downloadable Excel file, the spreadsheet, that if you want to look at the hardcore details or if you want to throw data into models, and that's what I do with Ag Radar. Those are two ways that the information is generated. It also is generated as email weather reports, okay? And we send those to the email address provided by the subscriber. We give up to two addresses per subscriber. I think we're gonna charge $10 more for two more email addresses and cut it off at four. Yes, thanks, Glenn. Well, it's 131. My voice is going hoarse. I think you've all had enough. But if you have questions, send me an email. We could, we could follow up with that. And like I said, we'll have an announcement coming out here sooner than later. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Glenn. All right, thank you. Thank you.